today we're going to be focusing on um, using Philippians 1, 27, where this phrase comes from as a springboard, and we're going to be focusing on um, the Christ hymn in Philippians 2. And, and I have to be honest um, that I feel... <clears throat> Um, I've been feeling a lot of trepidation about talking about this to you because I, I feel like this, this telling of Jesus' life uh, that we find in Philippians is at the core of who we are. Um, there, there's, uh, I, I've been um, thinking, uh, one summer when I was in college, um, I had just gone through um, a nasty breakup, and um, and so I decide I set myself the task to memorize Philippians two, I'm not Philippians two, the book of Philippians, um, and did that summer, and so that was um, that was like 33 years ago, and so these words uh, from Philippians and especially Philippians two have been playing in my mind and have been on my heart for all these years. And so, so um, wow. Uh, so I, I feel some, um, I feel the weight of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, my husband asked me yesterday, hey, do you have some good jokes? I'm like, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about Christ's humility. That's not really, I'm not really sure how to like stick a joke in there. So. So my, um, my comment about the prayer for, that, that was my joke. <laughs> so I ho hope you enjoyed that, because now, now, now we're doing the, big, the heavy stuff. So um, we all know the stories. Um, Paul and Silas traveling to Philippi after the Spirit sent Paul the vision of the Macedonian man. Paul praying by the river and baptizing Lydia in her household. Paul casting out the demon from the girl who was stalking him. Remember this? Following him around, shouting out, um, and, he, and in frustration, he finally um, um, casts out that demon, and, and they're unhappy about that, which ends up landing him in prison. Remember him and Silas? We, that story we love of them being... Um, in prison at night, midnight, singing hymns and the earthquake, and um, the jailer, uh, and the aftermath of that. I mean, that is, uh, wow, what an inspiring, rousing story that is. Um, Paul, in this, let's see, where's mine? Um, this is the setup. And Paul loves this young church in Philippi that, uh, from what we can tell, his first um, time with them was just a matter of a few weeks. He was there a really, really short time uh, before he left them uh, and, and moved on. Uh, and he feels about this church like a father, like they're his children. And... Uh, he has uh, the weight, the concern that he has for them, uh, the, the concern that he has for their spiritual health and maturity in their relationship with Christ. Um, all of us in the room have children, um, biological children or children that we've adopted into our homes. We know the weight of um, trying to mature, to, to bring faith to those children, and, and that's the way he feels toward these young Christians. Uh, so here's the scene at the beginning of Philippians, kind of the, the, uh, the ground that Philippians comes out of. Um, Paul is now in prison. There's a, a little bit of um, um, different ideas about exactly where he's in prison, but he's in prison, we know that. And um, he's been visited by Epaphroditus uh, the Philippians sent Epaphroditus to him. I'm wondering if this is still on. Tawny, where are you? It sounds like it's loud. Um, it's, it's turned down. It is? Okay. Um, 
So he's been p visited by Epaphroditus, who's come from the Philippians. And um, Epaphroditus, uh, the, the Philippians sent him as their messenger to tell Paul, here's how we're doing. Uh, to deliver the gifts that they had put together for Paul in his imprisonment um, and to, to comfort Paul. And Paul tells the Philippians that, that Epaphroditus has in fact done that. But, but something about what Epaphroditus tells him and uh, perhaps other people, other reports he's been getting from Philippi uh, concern Paul, uh, concern him enough to, uh, to prompt this letter from the Philippian, uh, that he writes to the Philippian church. Now, I remember a time when um, the, what I was, uh, the, the way that this letter was framed was as a letter of joy, and Paul certainly talks about that a lot. But, uh, but, but we know uh, from the way, again, the way we talk to our kids, that, that the things we talk about is because they need to hear the message, right? Um, and so when we tell them to stop fighting with their sister or to get along with their sister, it's because they're not getting along with their sister, right? Or to stop leaving the lid of the toilet seat up, it's because they're doing that. And so Paul, um, in his repeated um, encouragement to these uh, young Christians, telling them to focus on Christ, to be joyful, to get along, it's it's, he's telling them that because they're, they need to hear that. They've got a, a problem with that. So here's the, here's the problem. This church that Paul loves so much, um, he's getting a report from Epaphroditus and maybe others uh, that they are complaining and they're worrying and they're fussing with each other. Uh, they're squabbling. They're fighting with each other. And so he has some instruction to give them. So <clears throat> as he um, begins this letter, he begins by um, assuring them of his love, by praying for them and giving them a little insight into his own heart um, about his concern about whether to leave um, or whether to stay with them, whether it's best for him to go on to the Lord um, or to continue his ministry. Um, and then after he gives them that setup, he, he brings out the big guns. And, what he, um, and, and this is where his encouragement and his direct instruction to the Philippians begins when he urges them to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So um, here's how we, here's kind of the frame I think that we should hear this. All of us have, whether you said this in your own family or not, um, I know all of you have heard this uh, before of uh, um, when your child leaves the door to, um, you know, leaves your house to go to school or uh, when they're older, they're leaving your house to go on a date or they're leaving to go to college and the parent tells the kid, uh, remember you're a Williams or remember you're a McMichael. Um, or, you know, what, whatever your family name is. And, and it's a shorthand to remind your kids of, like, all the values of your family, right? To behave themselves, to do the things that they know that they're supposed to do. Um, or maybe if they're little, to not get their dress dirty or not burp at the table or, um, you know, wh whatever it is that you know that your kid needs reminding of. To remember who you belong to, remember the family that you belong to. And that's what Paul's doing here. He's, he's, he's telling these, Christ, these Christians, these young Christians in Philippi, with who, of whom he feels that he's their father in the faith, remember that you belong to Christ and, and act in a way that's going to make him proud. Well, hmm. Here's, his, here's what he says. <clears throat> I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He's talking about being in prison here. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed 
but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living with the, in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what, what, am I, what will I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary, excuse me, it's more necessary <clears throat> for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, Convinced of this, I know uh, that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the face so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. So Paul, acting as the Philippian spiritual father, uh, their father in the faith, encourages them to remember that they belong to Christ and that they need to honor Christ by the way they live, and that whether Paul's physically with them in Philippi or whether he's only hearing about them, uh, that they should act like Christ. And through the years, through the centuries that have passed, that's his message to us as well. Um, that whether he, um, you know, we don't have the benefit of him right here with us. And so um, his, uh, his words through the Holy Spirit encourage us um, as well to live in a way that honors Christ. But what a challenge, right? To be worthy. The weight of that. Um, to live like Christ. Uh, impossible on our own. No one can ever do enough, study hard enough, do enough good things, be pure enough to be worthy of Christ's love. Um, Paul teaches us a hard truth uh, in Romans 3. Remember this? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you might think about it like this. Uh, this is a, a picture of Mike Powell from 1991 um, who set the world record in long jump. Uh, it still stands. I mean, think about that with, with the way um, our athletes um, around the world are progressing. So this, this record has stand, stood now for 26 years. Uh, here's how far he jumped in that jump right there. He jumped... 29 feet and four inches. Isn't that incredible? I, I might can jump three feet. I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I can't. I was um, uh, thinking about this when I was um, uh, looking, you know, kind of thinking about this illustration and, and looking at my living room and trying to figure out, like, uh, like how far I would have to go for, I mean, 29 feet. Wow. Um, but, but if the Lord's task, if, if his measurement for us, um, if we could kind of imagine it like this for a minute, that his measurement for us to be good enough uh, to receive salvation, to be worthy on our own merits of Christ was to jump across the Grand Canyon, then Mike's 29 feet, I mean, that, like, he falls into the Grand Canyon just like I do with my three feet, right? We can't do it. We cannot do it on our own. And so <clears throat> we know from our reading of Scripture that Paul, I mean, Paul has a lot of expectations that he delivers to us um, through, his, um, through his inspiration, communicating Christ's will for us. There's a lot of expectations about our behavior dreams for us, hopes for how we'll behave in Christ. But, but what he's not saying, what he's not saying 
is to live sinlessly, to be worthy, to, to do enough on our own, to do more and more and more, trying to, to somehow earn, claw our way up to where we are um, equal or good enough for Christ. That, that's not what he's saying. And so, so if we can kind of take that off the table, um, maybe it will clear some space to think about what Paul is actually saying here. So Paul is always, as he always does, he grounds his teaching in the person of Christ. Um, he tells the story of Jesus many times um, throughout his letters, um, multiple times, and most in the long letters, and um, uh, in, in everything he writes, he grounds his teaching in the person of Christ. Here's just a few of them. Um, I think he, uh, every time he tells the story of Jesus, uh, the story is the same, but he he emphasizes certain points that his that, that the readers of his letters that his listeners need to hear. Here's just a few. Here's just a few of them. Oops. I had to slip this picture in. This is a girl that I just met last month. Her name's Vida. Uh, afterwards, I can tell you a little bit about her. So here's the solution <clears throat> that he offers us to our problem of fussing and fighting and bickering. <clears throat> you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles, and last of all appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. In 2 Corinthians, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all <coughs> died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. In Colossians, For Christ, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. <coughs> Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, <coughs> descended from David. I read through those, um, just those very few um, of the many times when Paul retells the story of Jesus to remind us uh, that when, when Paul talks about, when he urges the Philippians and us to live a life worthy of the gospel, what he's talking about there and what he's about to tell the Philippians, what he means by the gospel is that is, is Jesus, the person of Jesus, and his life here among us. His being born to a virgin, his life, his ministry among us, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That is the gospel. That is the good news. That's the core of who we are. That's what all of Paul's teaching, all of who he is, all who he wants us to be and this church is all rooted in Christ. It all flows out of that. Everything we are, everything that matters to our life and that matters to Paul. 
So that's what he wants us to be worthy of. Now, there's all kinds of things we can talk about again, about behavior, and, um, and I was um, in a, kind of an earlier version of this talk. I, I thought, oh, maybe, I, maybe I'll have a chance to like, go through and talk about um, uh, sexual purity and not lying and um, being encouraging with, you know, all those things that Paul tells us. And, and all of those are true. But specifically, what he means here in Philippians to be worthy of the gospel is to root our lives to imitate Christ. To imitate Christ, the gospel, this story that he tells over and over and over again. And so, what does he mean? What does he mean here? So um, I was thinking about how uh, the stories that we tell, I mean, we do this too, right? We, we have stories that are kind of central to our family, and we tell them to our children over and over again. I ask uh, my kids, uh, my grown-up boys, uh, what, are, what are some of the stories that, uh, that, we've, that you've heard us tell, that Dad and I tell you again and again growing up? I got some really interesting answers. Uh, some of which were kind of surprising to me, uh, what stuck out to them. Here's one of the stories that I heard growing up. Um, and the details of the story always stayed the same, but the application was different. Uh, when I was growing up, I heard over and over again the story uh, from my dad about how when he was, uh, one summer when he was in college um, at ACC, uh, he and my Uncle Jimmy and another friend from college uh, went out to sell Bibles with for Southwestern. And that's when they were like doing the door-to-door -door thing, you know, and they'd lug their big, port their big um, suitcase thing that had the, all the Bible samples in them, and they would go door-to-door -to -door selling Bibles. Dad and um, their friend, their college friend, uh, did pretty well, but my Uncle Jimmy got all the way to August, and he had not sold a single Bible. And he was supposed to be earning his tuition for the next you know, to go back to school. So this wasn't a happy thing. So Dad and Uncle Jimmy, uh, not my uncle at that point, just a friend, um, Dad and Jimmy and this other, um, their friend, they would get together on Sundays and uh, go to church together and spend the day together. And on this particular Sunday in August, um, they stayed up all night long talking. And the more they talked, the more depressed they got. Uh, because uh, mainly because Uncle Jimmy was, you know, like, what on earth am I going to do? How, how on earth am I going to pay for school? And how on earth am I going to tell Mom and Dad that I haven't earned a single penny? In fact, I've, you know, like been spending money on my living expenses. And so I'm kind of worse off than I was in April. And before the night was over, the three of them had talked each other into enlisting in the Navy. <laughs> and they went that next morning, Monday morning, and they enlisted. And they called their folks and told them and left for boot camp <laughs> without ever going home to Texas from Arkansas. So I've heard this story. I'm looking at, where's Judy? Right? We've heard this story over and over again. Judy's my sister. Um, but it had, it had different points to it depending on the mood and depending on what I needed to hear. So sometimes the point was, college boys make goofy decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes the point was, uh, your Uncle Jimmy can be mighty persuasive. <laughs> and sometimes the point was more serious, you know, that, you're, uh, that, that you need to think through your decisions and don't make them at the heat of the moment. Or maybe, um, maybe the point was that your decisions affect more than you. And um, the, <clears throat> the particular spin on the story, uh, the, the, the details of the story always stay the same, but the particular spin on the story and what got emphasized to me uh, frequently was what I needed to hear at the moment. You know, I had made a decision without thinking about how it was going to affect other people. So I got the story again, you know. 
And Paul does the same thing for these Christians. Um, he tells them the story again, and he has a very particular point he wants to make with this telling of Jesus' story. And so here's how he writes the story to the Philippians to encourage them to stand firm in the one spirit, striving as one for the faith of the gospel, to be like-minded, having the same love. Here it is. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hmm. Well, I want to focus on one uh, phrase for the next few minutes. Um, and and I, we got started. You, you guys were late coming in here, so I'm going to take five extra minutes, okay? So if you're watching the clock, we'll end at 11.05. So the phrase that I want to look at is, um, is this one, that Jesus made himself nothing. That phrase, that's, that's the one I want to focus in on for just a few minutes. So the Greek word there um, uh, is, that, that's the way you spell it in Greek. And what it means is, um, the, the way that we pronounce it in English is kenosis. And what that means is self-emptying, self-emptying. Um, so you empty yourself of your own will to become entirely receptive to God's will. Um, other translations, this is a, the translation from the NIV. Other translations read, emptied himself, stripped himself of all privilege, made himself of no reputation, set aside the privileges of deity. In, in all of these, in each translation, the word uh, kenosis denotes a choice on Jesus' part to lower himself. Okay, it's not something that was thrust on him. It wasn't something that his circumstances produced. He made that choice to set aside his position and what was rightfully his to pursue humble obedience to God's will. So what can we learn from his example? So I've thought about um, some things as we think about humility and Christ's humility, and, and maybe a lot of your Bibles have that as a head, heading, imitating Christ's humility for this section. Um, so as I think about that and kind of what are some of the implications of what we can learn from that, um, I want to preface uh, what I'm about to say uh, with, with this comment uh, or with this caution. Um, the encouragement to be humble and to imitate Christ's humility uh, has, it is not something that pertains only to the half of the world's population that is female. And so sometimes I think, um, and we hear about this a lot in our press, and we talk about it with our little girls at school, um, you know, that, that they can do everything, and that is, that is exactly true. Paul's encouragement here, his, what he longs for the Philippians and for us, um, applies to uh, women who are 80 and men who are 50 and little girls who are 5. Uh, this this encouragement to be like Christ applies to all humanity. So just, just a, um, as you remember that. So here's some things that I think we can learn 
uh, from Christ's attitude of humility. Um, some things it doesn't mean. It does not mean, as we think about what it means to imitate his example, it doesn't mean that Christ humbled himself, that he was weak-willed, that he was wishy-washy, that he was namby-pamby, um, that he was powerless. It, it doesn't mean any of those things. Uh, we know that he, um, uh, that his humility, he clearly knew what that was going to cost him. And that there was going to be, um, and that it was going to bring hardship. His friends were going to abandon him. His parent, his mom and his brothers and sisters weren't going to understand him. Um, that eventually it was going to lead to a cross. He knew all of those things. And in courage and determination, he turned his face to Jerusalem. It doesn't mean, as we think about his humility, that he let his disciples run roughshod over him or that he was confused about who was the teacher and who was the, the student. Um, we, kn we know that's not the case. Uh, he stayed the course charted out for him by his father. He invited others to join him, but he refused to be sidetracked by Satan or by Peter, or by his cousin John, or by his disciple, the disciple he loved, John and James, um, or by Mary and Martha, or by the crowds, or by the teachers. He had a very clear, single-minded purpose. So his humility didn't indicate um, a, a, a lack of focus or a lack of understanding about his, his position or his role. That's not what it meant. It didn't mean that he tamped down his emotions, that he was a wallflower, that he kind of faded into the background. Uh, we know from Scripture that he was um, fully engaged with his experience as a man. He laughed. Um, he joked around, he went to parties, he went to weddings, um, he cried, he got angry, he was frustrated. Um, all of those emotions he embraced uh, and was completely himself in a forceful, charismatic personality. Um, his humility didn't mean he was worthless. We, we all know that, right? Although many people uh, that were around him thought that. Uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Remember that? Or, um, oh, he's doing that because he has a demon inside of him. He's a friend of sinners. In fact, he was in very nature God equal to his father. Uh, it didn't mean that his poverty and hard circumstances were thrust on him, out of his control. And I guess it bears repeating that he chose this path out of his love for us and his passion to reveal God. Uh, and it's a, it's a hard truth that sometimes God is revealed most clearly in our weakness. Uh, we see this over and over again in Scripture. It's not something that is, I mean, it's not comfortable. It's not a comfortable thing to think about. Uh, that God um, chose to let Paul keep his affliction, whatever it was. And he waited. He, he let... Abraham and Sarah wait for decades before he answered their prayer for a child. He, use, he uses little children. He revealed himself to Samuel instead of Eli, to David as a child instead of Saul. He uses people who were sick, people who are dying, he uses the very old, he uses women, he uses foreigners uh, to the Jewish people. 
His glory is frequently revealed through our weakness. Uh, and, and Jesus chooses this path of humility in order to reveal God's glory. John puts it this way. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. And now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So why does this humility matter so much? So I have three things, and we'll end this session with these three things. Um, his example shows us that humility is rooted in our trust of God. Remember when he said that unless we learn humility, we'll never enter the kingdom? Jesus called a little child to him and stood the child before his followers. And he said, I tell you the truth, you must change and become like little children. If you don't do this, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The greatest person in the kingdom of heaven is the one who makes himself humble like this child. Whew. Is there much sweeter than seeing a little guy taking his first steps, holding on to his daddy's finger? He, he knows his daddy is going gonna, is gonna to be there for him. Or watching that little girl jump off the side of the pool into her mom's arms, waiting for her. Hmm. Or watching that kindergartner's face light up. When she, she runs out of school and she catches sight of her mom. When our little boy, when our, our giant boy now, he's 6'5", <laughs> when our Jonathan was four, um, I overheard him talking to his, his big brother one day. It was in the summer. And they were making some plans for what they were gonna, how they were going to spend that afternoon. Um, and when they had made their plans, Jonathan's comment to David was, um, and, and mom will be watching us out of the window, and she'll clap. <laughs> you know, there was never a doubt in his mind that I would have my eye on them and my response. And Jesus' humility, his ability to set that aside and pursue this hard path of obedience with what was waiting for him is rooted in the fact that he is with un, he is knows with unshakable clarity that his father has his back that he loves him um, and, and we have that gift as well that we can do hard things because our father loves us so much. Um, his example shows us that humility does not diminish us. Uh, we are not lessened when we put someone else's needs before our own. Um, his choice to set aside his rights didn't ch change the fact that he was God's son. So when John, James and John ask him, uh, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other one sit at your left. You know, this move of power. Uh, he can tell them that they've missed the mark. 
sometimes I, sometimes I act like that. Like there's not enough to go around. I gotta, I gotta grab that last piece of birthday cake uh, before it's gone. And sometimes I act like that with my brothers and sisters. Like if I, if I give this time to you, there's not gonna be enough left over for me. Or if I um, expend these resources or this emotional, you know, whatever, like I'm not going to have enough left. Sometimes I act like that. And uh, Jesus' example shows us that humility, that honoring others in front of ourselves does not diminish us. Paul says that God comforts us <clears throat> comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. And he supplies that. He fills us up again and again. And finally, his example shows that humility demonstrates true love. John tells us that when Jesus washed his disciples' feet, he showed them the full extent of his love. That action demonstrated his love. So that Jesus' love for us is patient and kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It is not proud. Jesus' love does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus' love for us always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And this is the love he calls us church into. This kind of humble love that creates profound community.